In this video lecture, we're going to be focusing on that climactic description of the blinding scene as Oedipus's tragedy comes to its head. One of the reasons that Sophocles decides to present the uh, climactic scene to us in this way is that the structure of language allows him to more carefully control our emotional experience. If he puts it on stage, he has no control over where we're going to look, what we'll see, what we'll focus on. So much is going to be dependent on the actors actually delivering the scene as it is staged. If he delivers it here or conveys the scene to us through language, he can more carefully modulate and control our experience of this. So what seems on its surface to be a deflation in that we don't see the actual literal visceral horror of Oedipus putting out his eyes or coming upon the corpse of his wife, is in fact a very judiciously developed approach on Sophocles' part in order to control or to manipulate our emotional experience through revelations and concealments. What Oedipus or what Sophocles is trying to do here is to create a narrative mirror for the transgression of boundaries. Remember that this play as Oedipus has just observed, is all about the violation of boundaries, the transgression of boundaries, the touching of those things that should not be touched. That's exactly what he laments. Oh, you eyes that looked upon those things that they have never, that you never should have looked upon. You hands that never should have touched or have, that have touched those things that they never should have touched. Oedipus's incestual narrative and the murder of his father is um, all oriented around those transgressions. Oedipus's story, in fact, as he transgresses the limitations that are established by the gods for men, is likewise all about those violations of delineations. Here, we enter into this scene in exactly the same way. We have the perspective of a messenger, an observer, not a participant in the scene, but somebody who is almost like voyeuristically penetrating into the bedroom that Oedipus flees into. What I'm going to do is read through this section in its entirety, and then I'll start breaking it down section by section, highlighting the techniques that uh, Sophocles uses as he develops this response, or as he develops this piece. As I'm reading through it, I want you to take careful or pay careful attention to your own emotional experience. How are you responding to this? And what do you think that Sophocles might be doing as he has presented this material in order to control or to influence, I should say, readers or the viewers of this play? Choosing to tell them what happened rather than show them. And how does this give him a greater command over their emotion? In line 200 and or 1236, Poor, poor woman. What happened? The messenger. She killed herself. It's horrible, but you weren't there. You won't see the worst of it. Listen, you'll find out how much she suffered if I have any power to tell a tale. Well, then, she was in a terrible state. She went inside and ran straight to her bedroom, to her marriage bed. She was tearing at her hair with both hands, and she slammed the doors as soon as she was inside, then called a dead man's name. Lias, do you remember making love, making the child that later killed you? that left me to give birth to the children of your child, children of the curse. And she was wailing at the bed where she had conceived a double misery, a husband from her husband and children from her child. Then she died. I don't know more, because Oedipus plunged in, shouting so loud we could not think about her troubles. We kept our eyes on him, dashing up and down, raving about, roaring. Bring my sword, and where's my wife? No, not my wife. Mother of two crops, myself and my children. He was in a frenzy, and some spirit led him. It wasn't any of us servants. He went charging at the door, and bent them inwards with a terrible shout, as if someone guided him, plunged through the doors, fell inside the room. She was hanging there, his wife. We saw her hanging in noose of braided rope. Then he saw her. He howled in misery, loosened the hanging rope and laid her down on the ground, poor woman. Then a horrible sight. He tore out the long pins of beaten gold that had adorned her clothes. And I'll pause here just to note that's a horrible sight for them to see what he is doing. But also the horrible sight is emphasized for Oedipus as the last thing that he sees are those pins descending towards his eyes as he gouges them out over and over again.
crying out, Now you may not see the evil, not the evil I have done or suffered. From now on you must gaze in darkness on forbidden faces, while the ones you should have seen you'll never know. That was his litany. Again and again he chanted it and struck his eyes. Blood was running down in the sockets, staining his cheeks red, an unstoppable flood dashing down, a dense hail of gore. And so the storm has broken on them both. Husband and wife, their suffering commingled. He used to be, it used to be the happiness that they shared. Happiness indeed. But now, today, grief, unseeing madness, death, disgrace. Every horror that we know how to name. This entire scene is intensely sexualized in a kind of bizarre, violent, and erotic way. What we have here is this lurid, voyeuristic peering into the marriage room, into the, 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 the bedroom of Yocasta and Oedipus. And so we get this strange, sickly sense of transgression and taboo in our actions, just as much as the ones that have already taken place in there. It's steeped in this erotic violence and erotic taboo transgressions. There's this penetrative action using the piece of his mother. Oedipus takes the pins from her robes and dashes out his eyes, penetrating his own flesh using her in this parallelism with what he has already done. Even this moment of self-mutilative repentance is characterized by a series of transgressions so much like the crimes that Oedipus commits. His previous violation of the moral law, the breaking of a taboo, his assumption of the position of a god's, here I stand with them, he said, the sundering of blood ties and the transgressions of the bounds of sexual morality. It is this breaking of private boundaries, our voyeurism into the scene, that allows for the, the sublimity, the transcendent nature of the horror, pity and terror and catharsis of those feelings, as we discussed regarding tragedy, that define the play's climax. The audience becomes aware of Oedipus' blinding through a messenger. He and the audience with him and through him transgress into a private scene of loss and mutilation where the sublime and the horrifying bursts forth to its ultimate effect through the conjunction of amplifying horror and visualization. It is defined by emotional intensification through this piece. As we read through it and break down each of those examples, think about it like this. We have elements of amplification that flow one to the next. Each line, each image, each retreat and forward movement in the description of what happens is designed to build on the groundwork of each thing that preceded it. The emotional turmoil develops through a series of amplifications through the scene. And so too, Sophocles is able to control or influence the audience's subjective sense of pity and horror that develop in parallel with this emotional turmoil. The account of Yocasta's suffering serves as a kind of br bridge or groundwork that then is sort of left aside in order to amplify Oedipus's suffering because he is the locus of the tragedy. It starts out with the messenger's subjective interpretation, and yet it's so deflated, so evacuated of meaning because it's so vague and so broad. Listen, and you'll find out how much she suffered, if I have any power to tell the tale. So it starts out by deflating our expectations, by saying, or implying, I, if I have this power, it's all about how well I can tell the story. So I may not be able to capture the true horror of it. You won't see the worst of it, because you weren't there. That in of itself, that framing for the story that he's about to tell, creates a horrifying emotional context. You can't know. Everything that I am able to create, every emotion I am able to inspire in you, pales in comparison to the reality because I'm just gesturing towards it. So in this moment, telling us what happened rather than showing us and framing it in this way leads the audience or tries to guide the audience and the listeners of this play in order to respond with even greater horror than they would if they had seen it because it relies on the power of their imagination and the power of the story that he's telling we can conjure forth a more horrifying scene than the one that might be created on stage, be precisely because it's not something that we've seen. Likewise, he amplifies it by saying that it's dependent on his power to tell the story. He deflates his own abilities. And so, 
as the story progresses and becomes so palpable and powerful, it becomes all the more effective because our expectations have already been sort of lowered or diminished at this point. And he begins the story with this deflated comment. She was in a terrible state. Nothing emotional, nothing effective. It's almost like a letdown of emotions as we move through this, uh, this beginning to the story. That's so that Ed that uh, Sophocles can amplify and build the tension, build the horror. What we have here is kind of like the play in miniature. As we move through these series of suggestions and implications, this building sense of tension that we have throughout the entire work, we're just waiting for the axe to drop, for the knife to fall, and Oedipus to be destroyed. Not with anticipation, but with horror and tension and anxiety. And here we have the same thing in miniature. We start out in this place of little anxiety, of no fear, terror, or pity, and then it builds. As an introduction to the woman's suffering, this phrase, she was in a terrible state, is a kind of prelude to her husband's destruction, and it's strangely disaffected and detached. It's unemotional. It quickly then changes as the messenger narrates her physical expression of grief, her closing off of the room, her desire to shut off this pain from the world, to conceal it from him as it's being concealed from us. And so we get this lurid sense of watching and listening as we peer into the affairs of this couple. Um, the account then moves into her direct exposition of emotion through the apostrophe to her dead husband. She's speaking directly to Laius, and it establishes explicitly both the cause and effect of her sorrow. Laius, do you remember making love, making the child that later killed you, that left me to give birth to the children of your child, children of the curse? Here, we have a kind of delay, an attempt on Sophocles' part to interject with this dialogue in order to build tension. He wants us to be delayed, stuck in her dialogue as she reminds us of the things that led us to this climactic moment of suffering. And then he can leverage off of that. He can sort of launch off of that into the horrifying spectacle. It's a technique of delay to enhance the tension. There is then amplification through description of causes, delay and pity for the circumstances before we see the results of those circumstances. She was wailing at the bed where her, she had conceived a double misery, a husband from her husband and children from her child. And then... There's a lack of details. The doors are closed off. We can't see things. We can only hear it. And then she died. We're limited by the perspective of the messenger. Remember that Yocasta has closed the doors, so all they can do is listen and hear her suffering. So it's, again, a, a fixation or a focus on just one of the senses, that is, hearing of what she has done, so that he can deny us access and leave us hungry, wondering, fearing what's going on inside that room. The lack of details is a denial of climax. It's a denial of resolution. It's a denial of sight. An abrupt and absent ending to her life. It allows for us to see and experience the shock of Oedipus when he throws open the doors and sees her along with us. This process of delay and amplification continues on into Oedipus's entrance. Yocasta is almost like a means to an end. The messenger claims at this moment to not know more. I didn't know more because Oedipus plunged in, shouting so loud we could not think about her troubles. Oedipus's horror and grief and pain is so great that his suffering eclipses hers. He interrupts the scene of Yocasta's suffering and blocks her from view, blocks her from our emotional view. But because our emotions have already been primed by her suffering, we are then led into the, uh, the power of his pain because it's so great relative to hers. The messenger here finds himself cut off by Oedipus's entrance into the scene, and yet that narration and amplification of events continues unabated. Just as the wife is a means to an end, the inspiration of Oedipus's suffering, her pain and death serve only to intensify Oedipus's following destruction. Yocasta is arguably a tool that Sophocles uses to exacerbate Oedipus's suffering and magnify it to the audience. Sophocles then uses that same technique of delay by way of dialogue as Oedipus raves about, roaring, bring my sword and where's my wife? No, not my wife, mother of two crops, myself and my children. The dialogue denies us access to the action itself, that thing that makes suffering suffering, the happenings, the events. It's a technique to inspire terror rather than horror at the actual sight. Oedipus, or rather Sophocles, doesn't want us to see the gouged out eyes. He doesn't want us to uh, see the corpse because those things inspire revulsion and disgust. 
He wants us to feel the terror of anticipation. We're waiting for those moments to actually arrive. So he's dragging it out, delaying it as much as possible. He was in a frenzy and some spirit led him. It wasn't any one of us servants. Look at how Oedipus's actions in this moment are framed. They're, he is framed as being powerless at the mercy of forces beyond himself. It's as if somebody guided him, some spirit led him. So the true nature of Oedipus is revealed to us here. He thought that he was in control of his life, but he never was. He has always been led about by the nose like an ox, uh, by the spirits, by the gods, by their fortunes and their fates. He has a complete and total lack of agency that's anticip that anticipates his blinding scene. The audience knows what's coming because he's already blind. Then we get the sight. We get the scene that Oedipus himself has already encountered. Her suffering progressed in accordance with this principle of emotional amplification or intensification. And the same thing happens in the larger context of her husband's unmaking. Oedipus comes upon her body and experiences the horror of loss through the initial sight of her. She was hanging there, his wife. We saw her. We saw her, that is the messenger, at the same moment that we see her hanging there. It grants us insight and sight of her actual body with details. Now that these delays have finally climaxed or culminated in the point of her great suffering and her death, the end of her story, but that in and of itself is just one parallel sub series of amplifications of emotion, right? It's built up to this point using those techniques I've already described in her narrative. And it's doing the same thing as just a piece of the larger narrative of suffering and explosion of suffering that defines Oedipus. Then he saw her, he howled in misery, loosened the hanging ropes and laid her down on the ground, poor woman. Then a horrible sight. He tore out the long pins of beaten gold that adorned her clothes, lifted them up and plunged them into his eyes. So we have two things or several things going on here. First, there's an inversion of that penetrative action. That repeated litany of thrusts into his own eyes is meant to be couched in all of this erotic sexualized violence on the bed, the marital bed, where this blasphemous union has taken place so many times. It's meant to be this distressing parallel to the events that have transpired here. And his punishment here is just, it's fit to the crime. His blindness spiritually, intellectually, has been punished by physical violence. And again, it denies a sight. As Oedipus blinds himself, so too are we blinded and prevented sight of the corpse. And we build up to the horror. Now we're about at the explosive climax of the terror, when it's built to its highest point, and we can now have the release. And he cries out, Now you may not see the evil, not the evil I have done nor suffered, from now on you must gaze in darkness, on forbidden faces, where the ones you should have seen you'll never know. That was his litany, again and again he chanted it and struck his eyes, blood was running down from the sockets, staining his cheeks red, an unstoppable flood dashing down, a dense hail of gore, and so the storm has broken on them both. All of that terror is now released over and over and over again in that climactic series of thrusts into his own eyes. There's a, a symbolic union of the pair. Their suffering commingled, the narrator, the messenger says, as he takes that piece of his mother and plunges it into his own flesh. Everything is transgressive. There's this breaking of the boundaries of decorum and sexual union and family, and also the transgression into this scene of intimate suffering. Even in this act of self-destruction, however, there's a single moment of curious perversity. It is the culmination of all the prior suffering, not simply due to this terrible account of Oedipus's self-mutilation in its physical nature, but um, it also mingles that brutality with the verbal expression of his sorrow. The repeated gouging of his eyes mirrors his unending litany. So as he is screaming out that litany of curses, he is also has this litany of violent action as he's putting out his eyes and goring them. The amplification thus reaches its peak in this overflow of emotion that destroys Oedipus's rational faculties and reduces him into this brute, mindless beast that in fact he always was, because none of us have any intelligence. His physical action and his vocal litany are both acts of rote. They're generated from emotion and instinct, 
not rational thought. It's a litany, this repeated pattern of sayings. And the actions itself are just this in and out motion. There's no thought, there's no personhood, there's no Oedipus left anymore. It's all been wiped away in the storm. The storm of blood and gore, horror and transgression. The messenger creates a vivid and living portrait of suffering and of Oedipus's defining trait of reason being overcome by emotion. Because that's what Oedipus has done throughout this entire play. In his every interaction with characters, he's always allowed his emotionalism to overcome his reason and that it prevented him from putting the pieces together and understanding his true nature. When he engaged with Tiresias and Creon, his rashness, that desire for justice that led him into desperation, wiped away his reason, has come to the forefront here again. In his execution of a kind of symbolic fitting punishment for his crimes, for his blindness as he physically blinds himself, punishing himself for the metaphorical blindness to his true nature and to his relationships with his mother and his wife, and is now paralleled with that just punishment of putting out his eyes. It's that same process. You have, the chorus said, this kind of rough, wild justice that hurts you most of all. And it's true. Oedipus executes divine, perfect, I kind of ironic and fitting punishment and justice on himself as characteristically again he's overcome by emotion recall creon's assertion in line 673 you're as hateful now as you were fierce before your submission is as painful as your rage oedipus's submission now to the judgment of the gods the submission to those spirits that i said were leading him is as painful as his impotent rage against them earlier on in the play when he said i can make my own fate i can determine my own destiny Creon goes on, it's in your nature, a kind of justice, that you hurt yourself the most. Oedipus is prone to emotional excesses in relation to justice. He cannot countenance unrighteousness or the compromise or denigration or degradation of honor. The sense of justice is a virtue, but it's taken to its extreme, and it always leads to self-destruction as anything taken to an extreme must do. Here, it leads him to punish himself for his blindness with blindness. A life for a life with Laius, an eye for an eye, blindness for blindness in this case. The scene is alive and visceral, laying metaphors upon him, the metaphor to describe the king's physical violation. Oedipus's blinding then becomes a symbolic representation of his emotional transgressive acts. He breaks the boundary of his person, of his flesh, with the flesh of his flesh. He takes that piece of his mother and opens up his own flesh, just as he himself opened up his mother and, well, his father when he murdered him. He violates the boundaries of emotion and reason and decorum in his quest for justice. And yet in this moment of complete surrender to an emotional sense of justice tied to his nature, we also have another Aristotelian reversal. The keen and discerning mind that brought Oedipus to power and that he deploys to root out the source of his kingdom's curse destroys him and ultimately all that he holds dear. Because his intelligence, his wit, his cunning, his ability to solve riddles has led him to this point. That thing that made him a great leader, that made him a great man, that made him the best of us is also the thing that destroys him. In the bedroom scene, this core aspect of his character suffers an inversion akin to the reversals that Aristotle concerns himself with. Through this video lecture, I hope that I've been able to elaborate on some of the, the multiplicity of complex themes and ideas that, and approaches that Sophocles is attempting to develop. In the next series of video lectures for our second class this week, we're going to finish off our commentary in the play and look at Oedipus as he emerges a fundamentally transformed man. Now that he's blind, he's finally able to see. And because he is blind, because he recognizes that blindness, he finds peace.